Hello and welcome once again to St John's Virtual. There is a story about Martin Luther, the 16th century German reformer. In 1527, bubonic plague came to Wittenberg where he was living and everyone who could get out of the village got out. The Elector of Saxony, who rejoices in the name of John the Steadfast, ordered Martin Luther to leave, but Luther refused. Along with his pregnant wife, Katharina, Luther stayed in Wittenberg, even opening up his house as a, as a kind of like a hospital ward for the sick. In 1527, no one knew very much about plague, but they did know it was a particularly awful disease. The symptoms were terrifying and the fear of it was even worse. They knew that it was highly contagious and would most likely kill you in the most horrible way. Just being in the presence of someone who, was, who had it or being looked at by someone who had it was, was thought to be so dangerous um, that communities lived in constant fear. And the conventional wisdom at the time was stay away from anyone who is sick. So healthy people began to leave the city in, um, in great numbers, leaving behind those who were sick or dying. The shops were closed, doctors refused to see patients and priests refused to administer the last rites. But Martin Luther refused to leave Wittenberg. He chose to stay to look after those who were sick and even brought those who were seriously ill into his own home. So someone asked him if it was okay, if you were a Christian, to leave the city. And he wrote some pastoral advice entitled, Whether One May Flee From a Deadly Plague. And I think it has resonances for today. And he wrote, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order to become contaminated and thus perchance inflict and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me and I have done what he has expected of me and so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. If my neighbour needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith, because it is neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. In essence, then, in the face of an epidemic, Luther has a five-point plan, and that is, number one, trust God. Number two, pray for protection for ourselves, for our friends, neighbours and families. Number three, make the most of the technology available. Number four, do all we can to help others. And number five, perhaps most importantly, use common sense. Sound familiar? Well, I think today we could do worse than stick to that five point, point plan formed nearly 500 years ago. So to, for today we are in the capable hands of Peter Greystone and I'm delighted to welcome him back. He's going to offer us some reflections on our reading today. So let's hear our reading. Thank you. Today's reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, starting at verse 18. But when you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. When self-indulgence is at work, the results are obvious. Sexual vice, impurity and sensuality, the worship of false gods and sorcery, antagonisms and rivalry, jealousy, bad temper and quarrels, disagreements, factions and malice, drunkenness, orgies and all such things. And about these I tell you now, as I have told you in the past, that the people who behave in these ways will not inherit the kingdom of God. On the other hand, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, gentleness and self-control. No law can touch such things as these. 
All who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified self with all its passions and its desires. Since we are living by the Spirit, let our behaviour be guided by the Spirit, and let us not be conceited or provocative and envious of one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, St John's. It's good to be with you again. I wish I was with you face to face and that day will come, of course it will, be patient. Today's Gospel reading is about Jesus promising the Holy Spirit and I'm going to talk to you today about what St Paul said about the Holy Spirit in the letter he wrote to the Galatians. Following Jesus makes your life better. I know that's a bit of an uncompromising way to begin a sermon. Um, stone me, it's a dangerous claim to make. If I said it in a TV advert, I don't think advertising standards would allow it. But this is what I have personally found to be true. And in the ordinary business of earning money, sorting out relationships, going to church, doing the shopping, I sometimes think we forget why we're doing this whole Christianity thing. The reason for it all sort of gets lost in the undergrowth of living from day to day. Why are we Christians? It's because following Jesus makes your life better. Blimey, I've said it twice now. I'm going to have to come up with something to back it up. A conscious choice to follow Jesus changes people. If you've made that choice, then day to day you are accompanied and directed through life by an unseen presence. In his last days of earthly life, Jesus promised that. He said that even when he was no longer walking and talking with people, he would be with them in an absolutely real way, in spirit form. And that spirit would be holy. It's usually unspectacular having the Holy Spirit dwell in you, but it's actual and when you're aware of it, it gives genuine enrichment to your life. In Galatians, which was our epistle reading today, St Paul described signs of the Holy Spirit of Jesus burgeoning in someone's life. When someone becomes a Christian, they can expect to notice a noticeable increase in things like love, joy, peace. They're going to uh, experience more patience, more kindness, more goodness. Their lives will improve as people because they will be increasingly faithful, more gentle, have more control over themselves. These are great things. They're not illegal, they're not immoral, they're not fattening. Who could possibly not want these things in their life? They make your life better. I'm willing to admit that occasionally people oversell the Christian faith to those who don't go to church by saying that it's going to be like fireworks at midnight every single day of your life, which it clearly isn't. But most of the time, I think we undersell the improvement that we have in our working life, relationship life, leisure life, because of these undramatic but very positive qualities bearing fruit. I am relentlessly positive about the Christian faith and its founder, Jesus. It is good news. 
That's what gospel means, incidentally. It means news that is good. I just don't get the people who say, you ought to be religious, it's going to be a pain in the bum your whole life, but then you'll go to heaven and it will be payback time. I just don't get that. The reason that I'm a Christian is that after I made a decision that following Jesus would be the mainstay of my life, several remarkable things happened. I found an extraordinary sense of purpose in life. I found things making sense that don't make sense any other way. I've become a better person because I've been living for the benefit of other people instead of just selfishly. And most odd of all, I've been really happy. It's not winning the lottery and it's perfectly possible that I'm the only person in the world for whom it's worked like that. But can you see why in my quiet way I'm pretty upbeat about it all? There is a challenge to this beautiful, fruitful life though. There is a challenge because you don't have to let the Holy Spirit of God take hold of your nature. No one's going to force you. There is another nature which you could allow to shape your life. And St Paul writes about that too in our passage in Galatians. The fruit of this nature is these things. Impurity, debauchery, hatred. Sorry, I don't specially want to spoil your Sunday morning by reminding you of these. Selfish ambition, fits of rage, sexual immorality. They're in the same Bible passage as the beautiful things, so I've got to keep going. Internet porn, avoiding paying your tax, vile opinions about foreigners. That's strange. I'm sure they weren't there the last time I looked. Road rage, trolling people on Twitter, going on the lash and waking up in a gutter. I really am going to have to get my eyes tested, you know. Don't go back to these, writes Paul. For the love of love, joy, peace and all the others, don't go back to these. And then, in this passage in Galatians, he uses one of those weird metaphors that make you want to skip a few verses and get back to an easy bit, which I would do normally, but I'm not allowed to when I'm preaching a sermon. Thanks. Here we go. If you belong to Jesus, you are part of everything he has done and will do. So when he died on the cross, in a sense, you were dying with him. It was your old nature, the sinful nature, that died on that Good Friday. It's dead and gone. But Jesus isn't dead and gone. Since Easter Sunday, Jesus is alive. When he was raised from the dead to new life, a new life began for you too. The Spirit of God inhabits you now. Live by the Spirit. You're living as God's own people now. No going back. But we do go back, don't we? There's this battle going on. You know your life is being made better by following Jesus. And then you completely lose your cool and scream at the children when actually it's a problem of your own that's stressing you out.
and then you feel dreadful. Or you wake up with your head pounding like an industrial hammer and you don't recognise the pants on the carpet. And then you feel disgusting. Or you stay up until 3am on the Xbox and then upset everyone in the office because you're not thinking before you speak. And then you're sick because you know it's your own tiredness that's making you vile. Why are you feeling dreadful, disgusting, vile? Because that's not really you. That was the sinful nature. That side of you was dead and buried. And you've dug up the corpse! Uh, 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 uh. No wonder you feel so... But... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I mean, that's enough to get you back on track, isn't it? Nine of them. Repentant, forgiven, walking by the Spirit of God. That's pretty flipping good, isn't it? Through his Spirit, holy in every way, God is dwelling within you. I know. It's a metaphor that's so weird it would freak us out if we weren't so used to it. Especially children. Goodness knows what they make of it. Invite Jesus into your heart. Let God into your life. I mean, honestly. I was talking to one of my colleagues about this. And she said that after a sermon she preached, a seven-year-old boy came up to her and said, can I ask you a question? Obviously. And the boy said, what I don't understand is this. I am so small and God is so vast. If I had him inside me, wouldn't he just burst out? and flood all over the place. And she said, yes, that's how it works. I'm going to start these prayers with a poem sent to me by a friend who heard it on the radio. It's by an Irish poet priest called John O'Donoghue, who wrote poetry in the Celtic Christian tradition. So it's full of imagery from nature and resonates with Christian hope. I think it speaks warmly to our present situation. This is the time to be slow. Lie low to the wall until the bitter weather passes. Try as best as you can not to let the wire brush of doubt scrape from your heart or sense of yourself and your hesitant light. If you remain generous, Time will come good, and you will find your feet again on fresh pastures of promise, where the air will be kind and blushed with beginning. Father God, at this time of suffering and sorrow, of anxiety for ourselves and others, we thank you for Easter, for your risen Son, who gives us hope for new life and a glorious heaven. We pray particularly that we may be especially mindful to keep in step with the Spirit and try to live your risen life in our parish, with our neighbours, with our friends. Bless your church in the world and help all your followers to witness to your truth by the way they live their lives, as well as by their testimony. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are ill, all those who have died, and all those who mourn them, that you will comfort them. 
We pray particularly for those in our parish who need our prayers, including Sheila Arnold, David Kreitzman, Jean Dalgleish and Barbara Ewing. That your love and peace may surround them, Lord. And for those in our parish who have recently died, including Cecile Jean Charles and Beryl Ross. And for those whose years mind fall at this time, including Annie Elizabeth Thomas, Christopher Moore, Ivy Taylor, Kate Inge, Kate Burton, John Medrow, Judith DeFellon, Renee Taylor, Leslie Stevens, Lillian Harmer, Mavis de Barbara, Pamela Fleming, Muriel Inge, Edward Roberts, Robert Luckett, and Barry Richardson. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. And in a moment of silence, let us remember in our hearts all those across the world who are suffering from COVID-19. Those who have died from this dreadful disease and those who mourn them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Father God, for all the good things that are happening at this time, for the concern and kindnesses shown by many in our community. We pray for all those who are working so hard for us, for doctors and dustmen, scientists and shelf stackers, for delivery men and bus drivers, for our neighbours and our friends, and for those in our family families or known to us who are working on the front line in healthcare, transport, retail, education. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our country that when this is all over, we may work for a new society which is concerned for the environment so that we may retain the lovely fresh air that we are now breathing. We pray that we may hold on to the new values that we are now learning to prioritise, where care and love are more important than money and new possessions, so that we may live lives full of joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And we pray that we may soon find ourselves in a place where the air will be kind and blushed with beginning. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. And now it's my privilege to pronounce God's blessing for all of us. Hold us, O strength of our hearts, Rescue us, O Saviour and Friend. Anchor us, O Guiding Spirit, that we may know ourselves kept in the security that only you can bring, in that peace which, indeed, passes all understanding. Amen. And may the blessing of God, the one who calls and the one who challenges, be with us, each one of us, now and forever. Amen.